We are now in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at qualities of leadership. In chapter 2, Paul is directing his attention to the people in the church and how they interrelate with one another, men and women and authority, and we talked about all that. Well, now he's going to turn his attention to this church and church leadership. And in this, we get the qualities of both an elder and a deacon. And we're not going to cover the deacons in this video. We'll do that in the next video. But we're going to look at the qualities of an elder. And what I want you to think through as, as I go through this, although he's talking about elders, these are qualities of a leader no matter where you are in life. Because reality is a spiritual leader, a, a, a person who is a man or a woman of God, those people have certain qualities, and these are the qualities we want to look at. And so I don't want you to think in terms of, well, I'm never going to be an elder in the church, so this doesn't apply to me. It absolutely applies to you because you want to be a spiritual leader for whoever God has put in your life for you to lead. So let's just read through this, and I'll make a few comments uh, along the way. 3.1 says, Here is a trustworthy saying. Now this is the second time in this letter that Paul has said this, and he will say it again in chapter 4. And when he says, here is a trustworthy saying, he's saying, you need to listen to this. This is really, really important what I'm about to say. And listen to what he says. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, that's what my version says. Some of yours uh, might say some other words. Uh, it could be elder, it could be bishop. Uh, but overseer is a great word because that's exactly what we're talking about. And an elder is an overseer of people's souls. He oversees the spiritual development of other people. And he says if someone desires that, puts his heart on that, he desires a noble task. So I want to say a couple of things about this uh, quickly. Number one, he desires a noble task. Paul saw the desire to be an elder to be one of, the, uh, one of the most important things you could do in the life of the church. He saw it as, as an honor. And I have heard people say, well, you know, if, if you desire to be an elder, then you shouldn't be an elder because that is prideful. Not according to Paul. According to Paul, if you have a heart to oversee people spiritually, then you should desire to be in a position to lead them spiritually. And, and so I don't think this is uh, one of those where if you, if you don't want to be an elder, let's try to talk you into being an elder because you need to sit on the eldership. And No, I, I think one of the prerequisites of being an elder is you should really set your heart toward it and feel called by God to lead other people spiritually. Which brings me to the second point, and that is this. The first century church did not have the church government system we have set up in churches today. In churches today, we have a senior pastor, and he sets the vision and runs the church the day they operate into the church, and he preaches. And then you have an elder board, and the elder board, you know, works with the senior pastor and holds him accountable. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of issues that go on there between the senior pastor and the elders. But that's not the way the early church was set up. There was no delineation between pastors and elders because it wasn't about an office. Did you notice here it says he desires a noble task? Not a noble office, a noble task. The Bible never points out an elder or a deacon as an office in the church to aspire to because you want to have power and control over other people. See, that's all about self. That's about self-promotion. That's about selfishness and pride. No, this is... I aspire to be an overseer, and the role of overseeing people spiritually, not because I have any pride about it, but because I love the kingdom of God, and I want to see people grow spiritually, and I want to be a part of that ministry or that task, not an office. There's no such thing as the office of an elder. It's the role of an elder. And we talked a few videos uh, back about authority and spiritual authority. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So Jesus has all the inherent authority, and all He does is dole it out to people in order for them to fulfill their ministries God has called them to. So for an elder, it's not an office where He just has this power and control over other people. No, Jesus has the authority, and He's loaning it to the elder to fulfill a role in the church of helping other people grow spiritually. 
And in that time, there was not a senior pastor and an elder board. All of the, quote, pastors and elders, it was the same function in the church. And so you will see later on that, that elders got paid many times. And so when we think about elders today, and you think about elders in 1 Timothy 3, it's not the same thing. It is, it is a pastoral function and overseeing of the spiritual lives of the church, not sitting on a board uh, to hold the senior account, uh, pastor accountable and to make business decisions. Business decisions is really for deacons that we'll talk about in the next video. Elders didn't make business decisions in the original intent of the role of an elder in the life of the church. He is a spiritual overseer. So having said all that, and I know I said a lot to get there, let's jump in and let's look at some of these um, ap um, uh, qualities of a spiritual leader. He begins and says, now the overseer must be above reproach. It's a really interesting phrase. And, and as I've done research, a lot of scholars believe that that word above reproach is kind of an umbrella term for every other thing that he talks about with regard to the role of an elder and the character traits that they should have, that it's above reproach and then everything else defines what above reproach means. Um, I went and looked this up and here's exactly what above reproach means. The technical definition is, he lives his life in a way that gives no cause for others to think badly of the church or the Lord. So if you're going to have the role of an elder, if you're going to take that, that uh, role on as spiritual oversight of other people, you need to be living your life above reproach or in a way that doesn't, that doesn't give anybody cause to think badly of Jesus or the church because of their looking at your life, which tells you something really important. People both in church and out of the church, in the world it's true too, they're always looking to see what your life looks like. And they're making their decisions about the church and they're making their decisions about Jesus based on you and how you're living and how you're acting. So not just for someone that has the role of an elder, but for all of us who are believers, we need to be striving for this word, this phrase called above reproach, where my life so reflects the nature of Jesus that nobody thinks badly of the church or Jesus because of looking at my life. My life is, makes them want to search out Jesus and want to be a part of the church. Really, really important. And let me just say this as an addendum. Uh, people who don't do that, uh, some of the greatest harm and, and some of the greatest hurt comes from people who are not living above reproach and uh, they're living a hypocritical life, and that hypocritical life causes people to think poorly of the church and or of Jesus. So, got to start with this whole idea of above reproach. But if you'll notice here as we read on, he's going to talk about being above reproach in his, uh, in his family life. So it continues on, it says, uh, the husband, he must be the husband of one wife, and then I'm going to go on down from verse 2 down to four, verse 4. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? And so he must be above reproach in both his marriage and his parenting. Let's talk about marriage first. This phrase, husband of but one wife. I remember as a kid growing up in a little country church, and every time we would put in elders, the, the pastor would preach a sermon on the attributes of an elder, and he would go through these qualities. And the way they defined husband of one wife is, well, you can never have been divorced. And so anybody who was divorced in the church, they were just marked off the list, you can never be an elder. Meanwhile, they would put in elders who uh, had never been married except once, but those guys didn't have a good marriage. And I want you to know that that's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about how many times you've been married. It's talking about what are you like in your marriage. The phrase literally could be interpreted a one-woman man. A one-woman man. So in other words, if you're married and you want to be an elder, we're going to look at your life and we're going to look at your marriage and we're going to ask this question, are you a one-woman man? Are you faithful to your wife? Not just you haven't had an affair, but 
Are you given over to her? Have you made her a priority? Do you love her? Do you care for her? Because if you can't love and care and be faithful to your wife, how can you love and care for and be faithful to your church? And so, man, if, if you can't treat your wife well, if you can't be dedicated and faithful to her, then how in the world can we trust you to look out for the best interests of the church? So that's what that means. And that's really the same thing when it comes to the children, you know, because that same country church where I was, they said you have to have faithful children. And so they would, look at, they would look at a man's life, and if he had kids that didn't go to church anymore, that's how they define faithful, uh, then you couldn't be an elder. Well, again, that's not what he's talking about. When you read it here, he says his children obey him with proper respect. It's about managing the family in such a way that you're a good father and your children respect you for the parenting you're doing for them. It doesn't mean... You can't judge an elder based on how his kids turn out. I mean, you have free will. I know people who do a great job raising their kids, and their kids still end up walking away from faith. I know some people that are lousy parents, and their kids grow up to be dynamic, profound, amazing disciples of Christ. So it's not how the kids turn out. It's what's the process of the family look like? Is this man managing his family well? Do his kids respect him because he loves them and cares for them and shepherds them and oversees them? Because if he can't oversee his kids well and he can't oversee his wife well, then how in the world do we expect him to oversee the church well? So that's what it means to be above reproach with regard to the family. Now, there's also you've got to be above reproach in your character. And listen to all of these character phrases. And, and he actually... Uh, gives uh, five positives, or four positives, five positives, and then four negatives. And I just want to read all of this, and then we'll talk about, talk about it all together. He must be temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. See, there's the five positives. Not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. So I just want to run through these as we talk about the character traits uh, of a man of God, really, or a woman of God. Not just an elder, just a man of God or a woman of God. These are the character traits. The first one is temperate or self-controlled. Uh, my version says temperate, but self-controlled is probably the word that we understand most with this. It's interesting to me that self-control is actually a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control is something I'm able to control my urges because the Holy Spirit empowers me to control my urges. This is what uh, the definition of self-controlled or temperate here means. He is clear-headed, sensible, and disciplined in his life. He shows good judgment and can see things for what they really are. I like that phrase, disciplined in his life. If you can't discipline your body, if you can't discipline your urges, if you can't discipline your life, then you, then you have a hard time leading other people spiritually. That's kind of the, the baseline for a spiritual leader is you got to learn to control your life and, your dis and discipline yourself before you can lead somebody else. And so I think that's really important. It says respectable. In other words, he's honorable and dignified. He does not intentionally offend others. He's respected by his peers and his friends. If a person doesn't have respect out in the culture, or if they don't have respect in the church, people don't respect this person, then how can they lead somebody spiritually? I don't follow people I don't respect. And so if, if I'm going to be a spiritual leader and I'm going to ask people to follow me, I have to live a life respectable that's worthy of them respecting me, which means I've got to do what? I've got to do what I say I'm going to do. I've got to... I've got to act like a disciple of Jesus Christ. I can't be a hypocrite. I can't say one thing and do another. I've got to have the respect of the people that I lead. Hospitable is another one. Hospitable. In that day and time, hospitable looked different from today. You know, they didn't have a lot of hotels. They didn't have Marriott and Hilton back in those days. And so a lot of times when you lived in a city, People coming across through your city going somewhere else, they're traveling on foot or, or they're traveling with a camel or they're traveling with a horse and, and they're going along. They will stop in a city and many times the Christians would spend the night in other Christians' homes. 
They may have never met them, but they find people from the church and they stay with them. So if you're going to be a leader in the church in that culture, it was very important you had the gift of hospitality. In other words, my home is open to what? The Christian community. It's open. And so when people come through town, they're welcome to stay with me. I think today what it means is the same thing. My house is God's house. And He wants me to use my house to His glory. So what do I need to do? I need to be using my house to invite people over, to fellowship with people, to have studies in my home, to use my home to fulfill the kingdom purposes that He has for me. And so that's what it means by hospitable. Able to teach. Once again, in that culture, the elders were the senior pastor. You didn't have a senior pastor and elders. You had elders, and all of them needed to be able to teach. And so it was very important that they knew scriptures well enough. Remember, they lived in cultures where not everybody had a Bible, and many times the only people that had access to a Bible, and sometimes the only people who have access to read were the elders who could learn the scriptures and teach them to the people. Uh, in today's culture, I think it just talks about you need to know the Word of God well enough so when people come to you for spiritual advice, you give them good biblical advice and not bad advice from culture or from secular psychology or other things that can be hurtful for them instead of helpful. And then finally, gentle. In other words, you're not harsh or mean-spirited. And I think it's really important for an elder, for any sort of spiritual leader, to be someone who is gentle. You don't want to follow somebody that when you're going to them for compassion and help and comfort and maybe even a word of advice, they punch you in the face with the truth and they don't speak the truth in love. They just speak the truth and they hurt you. You can't be a spiritual leader if you hurt other people with the truth. And I've, I've, I've watched people do this. They hurt other people and then they say, well, I'm just being truthful. Yeah, but you can also be loving. You, can, you need to be gentle with your truth when you share that with them. And then when he goes to the negatives, not given to drunkenness. Not given to drunkenness. In other words, he exercises self-control over his fleshly appetites. There are all sorts of different areas where an elder needs to have self-control. He needs to have self-control over his tongue, right? Can, can you imagine following a leader who can't keep his tongue reined in? who you go and share something with him in private and he goes and tells other people in the congregation, oh, what a terrible, terrible thing for a spiritual leader to do. Uh, or you share something with him and he doesn't have that gentle spirit and, and he's rude to you and hurts you deeply with his words. He needs to be able to control his tongue. He needs to be able to control his pocketbook. He needs to be able to control his appetites, his drinking, his eating. You have to have self-control in the big areas of life. Anger has to be able to control his anger. If, if someone can't control those base appetites, he has no, no uh, reason at all to be able to lead other people. He's got to control that first. And then he says, not violent or quarrelsome. Once again, got to be able to control your temper, right? Can, can you imagine following someone spiritually who can't control his alcohol and can't control his temper. Think about what alcohol does. It lowers your inhibitions. So what? You're going to say things you don't mean. You're going to lose your temper, right? Can, can you imagine following somebody that was getting drunk a lot and they can't control those things because their inhibitions have dropped by alcohol? Can you imagine following somebody that loses his temper a lot that's, that, it's just, that is just not who a spiritual leader is. Not a lover of money. This one is interesting because in 610, chapter 6, verse 10 of 1 Timothy, he makes this very, very well-known statement that you may have heard before. He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So what does he say about an elder? He doesn't need to love money does not lead to love money. Why? Because if he's a lover of money more than he's a lover of people, then when things cross and he has to choose, he'll choose money over people. He'll hurt people for the sake of money. And what is it? Well, that's the root of all kinds of evil. So he says, you can't have that. You can't have that. Uh, when, it, when it comes to an elder, 
He's got to be in a place where he's spiritually mature enough that he can handle money and he puts people above money every single time. And then finally, not prideful. Listen to this. Uh, he comes down here in verse 6 and says, He must not be a recent convert. He can't be a new convert. Or he may become conceited or prideful and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Wow, what a statement that is. But what's he saying? He's saying, look, when you are in charge of other people spiritually, when you're helping other people grow and you take this role on, this is a huge role. And it's easy, if you're a recent convert, for Satan to really get in your head and begin to tell you false things about you. And you get prideful and conceited because look at me and look at all these people I'm influencing. And then what happens? Well, once again, what, is, what does Paul say and James say? Pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before the fall. If I'm prideful, I'm going to fall. What causes me to be prideful? Well, if I'm a new convert and I haven't been through some times in life, some tough times, I can be prideful when I am introduced to spiritual leadership because of all the people that are willing to follow you spiritually. It's interesting to me when, when you uh, are in an AA program, and you first come into that program and get dry, they don't let you sponsor someone else for several months until you have a track record of being dry. Because why? They don't want you to start leading someone else and then you both fall into the ditch and both fall off the wagon and get drunk, right? So they make you take a period of time to make sure that your change is real. Well, that's the same thing here. You need to be in the, in the Lord long enough that, that you can be protected from pride when you're leading people spiritually. That's why it's so dangerous to be on an eldership or be a senior pastor as a young man. I was, I was a senior pastor at 28. I was way too young and I could not handle it. I was not spiritually mature enough to be able to handle the pride that came, the temptation of pride that came with having that responsibility. So he says that and then finally, he wraps it up by talking about being above reproach with outsiders. Listen to what he says here. Verse 7, He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. You can't have an elder in your church who has a bad reputation in the community because the community is going to look bad on the church because they don't respect the elder. So he says you really have to have a great reputation not only within the church but without the church so that he what? Won't fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In other words, if Satan can get you to fall and disgrace yourself when you're a spiritual leader, who else are you going to disgrace? The church and the Lord. So he says you need to be very careful. You need to be... Well, listen, if you're in a church, the most important thing in the life of your church is how you pick your leaders. Because you have, to have, you have to have a system that really takes its time and chooses people that are wise enough and spiritually mature enough to be, able to, ins to be able to fulfill these character traits because they're representing Christ, they're representing the church, and you don't want them to damage the church's reputation or Jesus' reputation because of their immaturity. So... That is, that is the character traits. That's the attributes of an elder. And I would say for our discussion today, that's the attributes we all want to be. I'm not an elder, but you know what? I want to be that guy. Whether I ever get to be on an eldership or not, I could care less. That's not the point. I want to be that man. I want to be that man because I want to have uh, the kind of spiritual influence where people want to follow me as I follow Christ. And so I hope you will aspire to these things as well. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Take this, print it off, laminate it, and keep it somewhere and just keep those traits in front of you and say, this is the man or woman I want to be, this person right here, and work on those things with the Holy Spirit uh, so that you can mature up to be a spiritual leader wherever God has placed you to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together in the text today. And Lord, this is just such an important text to show us the qualities of a godly man and woman. Not just a spiritual leader, but a godly man and woman. We want to be this person, Lord. And so grow all of us up to have these kind of character traits 
so we can be these people. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a great day.